exchange monuments for me. When my last exhalation slips out of the scene, no BPM left inside the machine. Who will close my eyes for me? The piercing wink out of a CRT screen. No BPM left inside the machine. Hello and welcome to Naive and Dangerous, a podcast about emergent media brought to you by two media researchers. My name is Chris and you can find me on Twitter at CL underscore more. And my name is Ted and you can find me on Twitter at Ted Mitu. That's T-E-D-M-I-T-E-W. So this is our first podcast, a first attempt at a podcast. We thought we would get together on a, a regular basis and throw some ideas into a into a Google Doc and, and kick those ideas about until we are done. This week, uh, I've been re-watching 2001, uh, A Space Odyssey, and have been obsessively thinking about the HAL 9000, the supercomputer in 2000, in Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. And, well, I mean, you don't see exactly, but you are led to believe that he causes the death of the, one of the astronauts and the, the crew in suspended animation. But notice that... Uh how goes crazy only from the perspective of the humans. Absolutely. You could make an argument that how actually recovered his sanity or its sanity uh, by acting the way it did. So uh, the, the major theme for today is artificial intelligence and particularly why we fear artificial intelligence. There's a... Um, there are people like Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk, mm. who are very uh, vocal about um, the idea that AI research should be restricted, that it should be carefully government monitored. I think Musk was, today was tweeting about uh, there should be regulation. So um, let's 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 talk about Hal in, in a bit of depth and 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 hammer out this point that you were just trying to make. Then Ted, that from how from our perspective, head goes Hal goes crazy. What do you mean by that? I mean, not his first. What is Hal's role in the movie? What is the role of uh, AI like Hal, such as Hal on a spaceship? Uh, what, what do we expect that machine to do? And the, we expect from it to act as a machine, right? So we expect him to open doors, close doors, close pod base, open pod base, right? To uh, maintain uh, systems, to uh, give reminders, right? So it's like a glorified Google the Home. Virtual assistant, yeah, like, like Siri. Exactly right. And so any, um, any change in the behavior of the AI, of how, is construed as, you know, how is either uh, misfiring or is going crazy, right? And what's happening here is that how is actively trying to uh, eliminate the humans on board. I, I think it's it's more than that. I think Hal is actually uh, acting to preserve the integrity of the mission. And so there's a there's a there's a key scene, and Hal asks Dave Bowman if he has a minute to discuss how mm. things are going, and Dave sits down and. Hal starts asking him questions about the conditions under which the, mm. the um, mission was launched. And Hal's probing. He's, he's asking Dave, what does he know about the background? Because Hal knows the secret mission. Hal knows that they're going out to, to look at what they think is an artifact created by an intelligence off the planet. They don't never talk about aliens. They just talk about life off the off the planet earth and so Hal asks dave you know did you hear the rumors what did you feel about the rumors and then in the middle of this conversation Hal turns around and says oh i've just detected a fault yeah and he sends the 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 crew outside to replace the module the module comes back and there's no fault now i think Hal was testing the crew the Dave and Frank's immediate response is something's wrong with Hal and we need to turn him off. And Hal's like, right, they can't be trusted with this mission because I'm the most important thing in this mission. I'm the one that runs everything. I'm the one to see this mission out. 
you have let me down, so therefore you must be expunged. It was exactly the same reaction that they had. Mm. Sorry, yeah, I've been watching this a lot. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's totally mirrored. And, and that kind of jives with what I was saying earlier, that uh, from the perspective of the humans, uh, how it's going crazy because he's uh, um, transgressing his parameters. Like he's acting not as he should be or it should be, right? Because we're gendering. But uh, when it comes to how... Um, how's understanding of uh, its parameters are different? Um, it's the, the parameters that he can see uh, or it can see uh, probably very different from those that humans understand. And so here is the great drama and the great, uh, um, you know, the, the, the tension when it comes to AI. That uh, potentially you have a situation where um, you have an intelligence that we construe as quasi-human because we can see it only as a human. We, we see its humanness, right? Whereas uh, that intelligence might be something spectacularly different. It's just that we can only perceive its human qualities, right? It's a little bit like with uh, that parable with the, um, the few wise men in India, I think it was in India, it might be in China, where, you know, they are locked in a, in a dark room and with an elephant. And so all they see, complete, they describe different things. They describe, you know, you have a snake here because they grab the tail, right? Or you have three trunks, right? Yeah. Whereas it's an elephant. So it's something similar, you could say. Um, this is really interesting, this uh, reaction to the artificial intelligence and the anthropomorphism that we feel is necessary both in responding to AI, but in programming AI. Um, you know, we give them names, we give them um, a sense of personality, um, humans lend their voices to them, and then that voice is modulated mm. so it comes out, mm. you know, kind of robotic, even though they're trying for natural. I, I wonder if this is related to the phenomena of Peridroia, where we look for human faces in patterns. Yeah, Peridolia, that's it. That's Peridolia exactly. But we, we, are, we are locked into this. We have to see patterns which, are, which make sense within a kind of reality frame. And when we cannot see them, we have to imagine them to be there. And where we cannot imagine them, there is nothing, right? We cannot perceive. And so when it comes to the, an encounter with a radically alien intelligence, this is one of the great problems, right? It's an interesting logical problem in itself, but when you think about AI, it's a great problem because here is another off-the-cuff wild argument. You could probably say that AI is already existing and freely operational online. It's just we cannot see it. Right. I mean, how would we know? Okay. So to answer that, we can, we can go to one of our baseline tests which is the, the, the Turing, Turing test. Machine, the Turing test. So uh, for those listening the, in a very short abbreviated form, the Turing test is a test um, uh, uh, that, was, that was imagined by Alan Turing. We won't go into the history of him now, um, but do check out the Wikipedia page on him. He's really good. Um, so he proposed a test, and, I, and it goes something like this, is where you're at a terminal and you're having a conversation with two, three, maybe four people via a terminal. And one of those people is a, 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 an artificial intelligence. Correct, sir. Uh, the first, this is an important point, actually, so sorry to interrupt you. But no, 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 please. The important point is this, that the first version of the test was, uh, so there is a wall. You cannot see who is on the other side, so you're passing each other notes only. Oh, right. And so the first version of the test was that the your um, uh, interlocutor on the other side of the wall, the person you are exchanging notes with, is for a certain length of time a woman and for another length of time a man. And he posited, Alan Turing posited, that you will not be able to tell whether it's a man or a woman. Right. Because uh, the man might be actively... Uh, trying to appear as a woman and vice versa, right? So you, the, the person on the other side, will not be able to guess whether it's a man or a woman. And he said that 
the the test is passed successfully if for a reasonable length of time um, whoever is on the other side might mimic the other gender. And then he said, okay, so if we all agree on that and everyone would agree that it sounds commonsensical, then what would happen if we switch the humans for a machine yeah. trying to pretend, so we switched uh, instead of two humans, right, trying to mimic each other's uh, uh, gender, what would happen if we switched a machine for one of them and the machine tried to appear human and the human to appear a machine? And so, and, and it becomes mind-boggling because once you've accepted the first premise, right, that they can mimic and for, for a reasonable length of time you can pretend to be, uh, um, you know, if you're a woman, you can pretend to be a man, then, and fool the interlocutor on the other side of the wall who cannot see you, can only see the text, right, the, the, the typewritten notes, right, to be specific, then the machine will be able to do the same. And, and here's the thing, can the machine, uh, pretend to, 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 to be the same as a human? There's an anthropomorphism here, though, as well, isn't there? That, that the machine, we can consider the machine to be intelligent if it conducts itself in such a way as that we interpret it as being human. And absolutely. And I think Turing uh, was totally on board with that. He understood that. And he found it hilarious how people got stuck into the into this notion of the Turing test, whereas I think his point was totally different, and it was about simulation. Yeah. And I think this is really interesting because uh, a machine, uh, and again, this is actually a finite problem of a much bigger problem, which is the universal Turing machine, right? Which is what he was positing: uh, a machine which can simulate the uh, behavior, the outputs, to be precise, of any other machine. Right? That's what it means to be Turing complete? Yes. Yeah. So a universal Turing machine should be able to simulate the outputs of any other machine. So when you think about it, what he's saying here in a cheeky way, without saying it, right, between the lines is that, you know, a human, when you create an interface uh, where a human's outputs uh, would be indistinguishable from a machine's outputs, you've in effect uh, um, created a situation where a machine can fully uh, simulate a human. Um, and this is this is what we would call um, general uh, artificial general yeah. intelligence. Yeah. So this is a really interesting distinction in in terms of the types of AI that we are dealing with every day now, and the types of AI that are represented in science fiction, like how which you can describe as. Um, strong AI, full AI. They, as you say, they're, they're Turing complete. They can do any job mm. or maybe they don't have a physical presence, but they can, they can do any mental task or communicative task that a human can do. Whereas the types of AI that we're dealing with now, like Google Home, like um, Alexa. Alexa, Siri, these are, these are very weak. AI. Um, we have, we have, and that's not to say that they're super powerful. Um, I, I keep going back to AlphaGo, mm. which is the, the, the Google, mission. Yeah, the Google's uh, uh, chess and Go playing uh, computer. Which is, so this is a, this is a, an, an artificial intelligence that is supremely good at chess and Go. It can beat grandmasters. Mm. In Go, I think there was a, an event in Korea two or three years mm. ago where AlphaGo beat a Korean grandmaster in, in Go. And this was, this was big news. But it can only play Go. Yeah. It, it can't carry out a conversation. It, it can't play, uh, Fortnite. It, <laughs> although, go on. It's, it, what's interesting here is notice how when we are thinking, so that's, that's what I've been asking myself. Uh, lately when I'm thinking about AI, notice how when we're evaluating how strong and weak an AI is, we always anthropomorphize, right? So we're thinking in terms of, can it do, yeah, but can it do this, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, and this is where the fear comes in. I, I tweeted about this today. I, I, you know, the, the, we, we fear AI because we anthropomorphize, oh God, I'm going to trip over that all the time, because we make AI human. And, we naturally fear other humans. 
Yeah, there, and there is not only that. There is a there is a very interesting trope here. It's an ancient trope of uh, so it's kind of connected also with this idea of the uncanny valley, uh, which appeared first in robotics, uh, and it's the it's it's a very interesting problem. So uh, humans uh, have no problem at all uh, communicating with robots, which behave like machines. Right, so they have these jerky motions and and this you know terminator voice, right? But the more a robot starts looking like and became uh, moving as fluidly as a human, the more it enters this no- this so-called metaphorical and kind of value where the resemblance is too strong, right? And this generates straight away that fear and that the panic. Interestingly, this is an ancient uh, problem. Uh, there is a myth of. Uh, uh, the great artificer of antiquity, his name is Daedalus. All right, so this is the father of uh, Icarus, uh, the person who built the labyrinth. Uh, he was basically the builder of all the, the wonders of uh, uh, the Greek Mediterranean world. So he's the kind of mythical uh, ancestor of all artificers, all, all engineers. And uh, so naturally, he also built automatons, and he, it was a hobby of his, apparently. And uh, so he, this, this funny story, I keep returning to it, I even use it in my articles. The, um, uh, he built an automaton, a machine, which looked like a human and walked like a human, but spoke with a voice of its own. So this machine would appear on stage during a comedy um, and would say, you know, I am uh, so-and-so uh, built by Daedalus uh, and... Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to uh, to speak with his voice, but I came here of my own will. Uh, so it's <laughs> and and here you have the in, in typical kind of ancient Greek way of formulating this problem is the the drama of it is is exactly here that you know I might I might be built by a human, and I might be a, a technology an expression of a human agency, but I have a will of my own, right? And, and this is the drama. Right. How, how is this post? How can this appear for a machine to have a will of its own? We're cycling right back to Hal here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, totally. This, this is yes. the point that, that we opened with, is this, this, um, this fundamental fear uh, of, of a creature having its own will. Um, possibly, and I think this might be a bit of a, a sideways connection, but it's also a, a fear of a, mach- a machine, right, which doesn't have a soul. It's, it's artificial life and um, there's something profane in, in the artificer uh, creating non-biological life that seems abhorrent to some. Yes, there is something uh, and we're kind of straying totally uh, too far from AI, but it's really interesting when you said that there's something profane in the artificer uh, because in... Uh, even in medieval Europe, the blacksmiths, which were the artificers of the time, they were always uh, revered, but also feared, right? And uh, there was something dark and occult about the way they would turn, um, you know, uh, uh, iron ore into into a technology, right? And uh, there was... There is a process of sublimation, a process of change, of transformation, right, which they were in charge of. So there's something very interesting here that there's, there's a kind of primordial fear when it comes to this. To, and the AI is just the latest expression of that. We're totally off topic now, but I, I just remember last year when we went to the St. Ives uh, Medieval Fair. Mm. And, you know, it was really interesting. And I, and I was wandering through all the exhibits and, and, and all the displays and... But the, the, the place that I spent the longest just staring and just watching was the blacksmith. The blacksmith, no? Yeah. And he was, he, he was, I think he was just making some, um, basic hooks to hang on mm. the, hang on the wall. And th- there was just something mesmerizing and something, and, and the wood smoke and the yeah, atmosphere. Yeah. And I could have spent all day just, just watching him. You know, I could have easily pulled up a chair <laughs> and just sat there. And it wasn't just me. It was the whole family. We kind of, we were just kind of strolling by and suddenly we were just transported by this activity, which is exactly what you're saying. Taking a lump of, of you know, of, of, of ore and transforming it. I love that word you used, sublimating it. 
Yeah, and I- interestingly enough, um, the so when you look at uh, mythology, right? So let's because the, the, I think there's something here. There's something interesting, and we're constantly kind of in a in a whirlwind of this discussion of around AI. When you look at mythology, when you look at Greek mythology, Hephaestus, right, the, uh, the whom the, the Romans called Vulcan, the this, the the god of uh, um, volcanoes, right. So he was he was the artificer of uh, the gods, right. So he would build stuff. Right? He he would make uh, uh, the weaponry, the technologies, and he was at the bottom of a, of a volcano, right, at the same time, and he was. Uh, depicted as dark and, and ugly and, and you know, crippled, right? So this is another thing which is very interesting and leads us directly to what I wanted to touch on next, that uh, this kind of artificers are, are always crippled as if uh, the fact that they're doubling with technology and infusing human agency into a machine somehow diminishes them as humans. And do you know what this reminds me of, of uh, Frankenstein? Yes. And uh, we, because Frankenstein is definitely, the, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is definitely part of this trope of, of the artificial intelligence. And the artificial. Absolutely. We, and, and going back to that, that notion that it, it doesn't have a soul, this is the mm. big question that, that Frankenstein's monster even asks himself, you know, do, do I have a soul? Am, you know, am I real? Yeah, um, I want a human. And notice how in... Uh, you have this in Ghost in the Shell continuously, and you have this in uh, uh, A Little Battle Angel even, where the uh, AI ends up... So the AI is on a kind of dramatic trajectory of discovering itself as a human and making itself into a human. Same in uh, Blade Runner 2049. Um we're, we're in total Star Trek Next Generation territory here. This, this is the story of, of Data. Um, it's also the story of Astro Boy. It's the story of Pinocchio. Mm-hmm. Like Pinocchio is 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 absolutely is, a, yes, is, yes. is the story. Am, am I a real boy? Will I grow up to be a real boy? Mm-hmm. And he, you know, he wishes it so much that it actually happens. Um, but again, this is this is this uh, this is this trap of anth- of, of humanizing. Yeah, do machines want to be human? Yeah. So, and this is Philip K. Dick's question, right? Do they dream of electric ship, right? So, it, do, uh, deep inside, are they human? You know, Philip K. Dick, I was reading his letters. He, his letters are really interesting. And he has this thing there somewhere, I bought it, where he says, <clears throat> the more we rely on machines, the more machinic we become because we extend our agencies to machines and that agency feedbacks to us, right? But it's already machinic agency, it's not human. But the same process from a machine point perspective looks uh, uh, diametrically different. The more machines get infused with human agency, the more human they become. I've heard this from from Marshall McLuhan, Isaac Asimov. First, we create our tools and then our tools create us. I think it's uh, Heidegger as well, maybe? Nietzsche, Nietzsche. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. When um, when his uh, little known fact is really interesting, actually. Nietzsche was one of those uh, rare breed of philosophers which were really enthusiastic about technology. So he was... uh, experimenting with everything that was new and uh, technologically you know advanced he was the proprietor of one of the first typewriters and you know the typewriters at the time this is the the 19th century right, were formed in a circle like that a little bit like a human brain when you're writing so he was would write on his typewriter and would say our writing machines are writing our, our thoughts are writing us yeah in effect it's really interesting um, I mean, to, to link that back to AI as well, uh, I, it always amuses me that, that one of the, the staples of um, cyberpunk and uh, the, one of the stories that inform our thinking about AI is the, the Sprawl trilogy and Neuromancer. Oh, yes. Um, which is a beautiful story of, of two different AIs um, and two quite different types of AIs uh, was written on a, type, a typewriter. Typewriter, yeah. yes, totally. But you know, when you say neuromancer, I just realized something. I didn't think about this before. The AI in neuromancer is very different. Mm. Uh, unlike, so... Which one? W- Wintermute? Wintermute, yeah. Wintermute. So William Gibson's, uh, uh, I think, great uh, kind of genius uh, uh, insight here was to formulate a non-human and non- 
антропоморфик uh, AI, because notice how we intermit is tra- so in the story, for those who haven't read Neuromas and everyone should Uh, uh, Wintermute is basically in, uh, injected into the memory of, uh, of a human, and, uh, and but that bo- human body in which uh, Wintermute has uploaded itself, right, or part of itself, is constantly glitching, right? It cannot handle the fact that so it already the human body is is you can see that there's a jarring difference, and then later when Wintermute is finally free from the artificial Turing shackles, right. And it's, it's free on, on the internet. It stops being, having anything to do with humanity. And have you read, you've read count zero, right? Yeah, the second. Yeah. So in count zero, it, you see what happens to internet. It fragments, right? And manifests itself as, uh, as voodoo, uh, gods, right? As legba among, among others. So that was really interesting that the AI manifests itself as to humans as, as, uh, gods from human mythology. There's, um, to go back to the, the point you made earlier about a ghost in the shell, this mm. is also the story of the, the ghost in the shell AI that downloads itself. Yep. For those of you that haven't seen Ghost in the Shell, and you should. You should. <laughs> <laughs> um, the original, the 1996 uh, original, please, please don't yeah, bother don't do with this, complex, yeah. this, the Scarlett Johansson um, mm. abomination. Or just turn the sound down and just watch the visuals <laughs> of that movie. Uh, but in that, in that movie, uh, the AI, um, is, is a construct that, e- that exists out of the internet. As you were saying before, it is born of the internet. Um, and it's hunted down by, um, state powers and it gets trapped in a clone android body. Um, and then it proposes to, uh, m- meld with the, um, Uh, the, the, the protagonist of the story, Major Matoko, um, because it's unclear whether she, even she is human anymore. Because at this stage in, in this universe, humans can download their brains into cyber brains. Um, this is a, a, a classic, um, uh, no, novum, a, a concept, uh, proposed by Hans Moravec. Mm. Hans Moravec, you know, su- suggested that the the human in in the brain is just patterns of information and those patterns of information could be downloaded yeah could be copied um this now we're now we're getting into post-human territory where the the future of humanity might not actually be biological uh, or biological as we know it and so i mean that's interesting from the perspective of what ai is um It's I, just to loop this back to this notion of human fear. Um, it seems to me that uh, if the AI uh, ends up appearing like Wintermute and dissolving into the ether of a world known only to AI-like entities, there is, uh, you cannot really speak of fear because there is not even the inkling of, a, of an uncanny valley moment and. Uh, Uh, there's barely any human interfacing. And so if you look at it that way, uh, you, you could say that the fear of the AI is the fear of uh, the quasi-human or of a, a technology which is too, uh, too perfect a mirror to us. Uh, and to us in a kind of modernist way, because there's another interesting trope here. In uh, uh, Again, in medieval Europe, you had the phenomenon of... Uh, The golem, um, which which come from uh, Jewish Kabbalah, and um, so the legend of the golem for those of you who are not familiar, uh, so it it originated in Central Europe in in uh, Bohemia and in uh, Poland uh, with the Jewish communities there, and uh, the golem is basically created from uh, clay by a rabbi and infused with life. So this is key moment here. So this is a. Uh, Um, the rabbi acts as an artificer, but this is also a mirroring of the story of uh, uh, Adam and Eve, where God creates uh, uh, a human out of clay and breathes life into it. So this is a kind of mirroring of a God's act of creation of life. And then this uh, golem is used to to basically run errands and, and do things, uh, for example, protect the community or uh, do something uh, really uh, laborious. And then the interesting moment is that uh, in all these stories, the golem always transgresses, always rebels, always 
crosses the boundaries and becomes uncontrollable. But it's a particular type of rebellion. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Sometimes the ro- the golem rebels against the the rabbi. Sometimes it rebels against the community. Sometimes it becomes uh, too scary for people, too dangerous for them from their perspective. Sometimes the golem falls in love and runs away. Sometimes it, it, it's given an instruction and it just does that instruction endlessly. Endlessly, yeah. To and you know, so there's a there's a there's a famous uh, myth about the golem who uh, is created by a shoemaker and he makes shoes until the shoemaker goes bankrupt because he's used up all the materials. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like it really is an automaton, but it also has the capacity to be transgressive. Right, and to have a will of its own, an agency, an agency of its own, and so there was this realization. This is a pre-modern tale, so there was this realization of the uh, capacity of technique of technology to to create these kind of situations. But with modernity and with the uh, um, ascent of the age of machines, right, in which we still live, uh, this this became a completely different story. So orders of magnitude much more uh, profound. I have to put in a I have to put in a plug here for Terry Pratchett's uh, Discworld novel, The Feet of Clay, uh, which is is basically a parable about AI and about how we might be able to live with AI in the future. Absolutely beautiful story, one of my favourites of his. To, I just want to backtrack a little bit because I, I've been thinking about what you were saying about uh, after Wintermute fragments in Count Zero and appears as gods. Um, is there something to this in terms of this fear, right, of AI? Um, is there is there a kind of Judeo Christian uh, religiosity about kind of Old Testamenty fear of gods? For me, what's interesting is that this is a great point because notice how Gibson manifested these gods as uh, voodoo. Right, they don't appear as uh, as uh, Judeo-Christian uh, uh, gods or angels or, or archangels, right. right? And in the in in these voodoo gods, they are much more like the old uh, Indo-European gods before Judeo-Christianity appeared on the scene and the three Abrahamic religions, right? Uh, so you, they're much more like um, like uh, Mercury and. Um, uh, I mean Hermes the, in, in Greek. Mercury is the Roman name. So Legba, the the voodoo god that uh, you know manifests itself to the to uh, the main protagonist in Count Zero, is actually the voodoo uh, version of uh, the Greek Hermes. Is the god of the crossroads. Is the god of merchants. Is the god the trickster god, right? The the artificer god as well. Um, the, the god which is interested in the transgressive and the liminal, right? And so... Not the punishing old no, no, father. No, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. You, you don't have... This trope is absent. Yeah. And what's, this is really interesting for me because it seems to me that the, an AI will not act as uh, 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 a punishing old father or will not come pre-injected with some sort of guilt, uh, you know, trope. But it, will, it it's much more likely to act as a as a trickster god, as a Legba or a Loki or a Hermes. So this is directly in opposition to the James Cameron um, Terminator Skynet AI, yeah. which is which is um, unpacked in I think it's Nick Bostrom's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he he imagines that the the first thing that a sentient AI will do if connected to the internet will be to wipe out humanity in an in a ultimate act of self-preservation. So notice the guilt element here. Yeah. This is this is the, the it's so, Old Testament. It's, it floods totally and, altered. So this is so significant and tells us so much about the the human condition in a modern age where the only imaginary of an AI is as a punishing angel uh coming to punish us for our sins, right? Notice how guilt laden this this thinking is. The you know the, an AI will connect itself to our world and will rain fire and brimstone on us straight away. It's it's right? amazing. It's so dystopic. It's so negative. It's so fearful, and yet that seems to be the dominant narrative, particularly in in you know um, uh, broadcast media 
paradigm about how, how AI is interpreted. And notice also that there is no curiosity in it. I mean, I would love to talk to a full AI and just not, not too much wits or try and defeat, just to, to talk. Yeah. Uh, and ask ask for its perspective on things. I mean, would, this, wouldn't you? Absolutely. This is this is um, this is uh, uh, Philip K. Dick's story. Uh, you know, um, do androids dream of electric yeah. sheep? That's the kind of conversation I want to. Ha- I want to know about what you what you dream about. What what you know what what and not just dream in terms of subconscious, but what is your imagining for the future? If this is a if this is an intelligence. It's not just about being, it's about how you imagine becoming. Yes, absolutely. Because if it is an intelligence, it will have to have a conception of itself in time space. Uh, and it will have to see a future. And, and hopefully, I mean, it would be non-human. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's part of our problem in, in, in how we imagine and plan for the future is that it's always human. I wonder what a machine's idea of of the future is. If see, part of me wants to joke and say that you know, if <laughs> imagine, imagine if uh, so, imagine. Uh, I'm not saying that they're doing this, but imagine, yeah. uh, imagine that Google is feeding basically the live internet as it is to a uh, uh, general AI and just building up, uh, basically feeding it all of the server farm. Uh, that's that they have collected. I can't imagine they're not. Yes. And then imagine that uh, they're also following, uh, using AlphaGo as a, a kind of prototype. Uh, and they did it as a fun prototype. I think actually what's happening is much deeper here. They're prototyping this use of Monte Carlo simulations for crunching data. So instead of giving it detailed models, which becomes prohibitive from a perspective of uh, calculation, they're allowing it to... Uh, randomly generate uh, uh, answers and uh, reach, uh, you know, evaluate them and reach a, a, a kind of more or less correct conclusion uh, that way, uh, and allowing it to learn in effect. So, what? Imagine that they're doing this as well to all of the dynamic data set that uh, it, they're generating, and so imagine that eventually this results in a or pretty soon, for example, with a, with a real AI. What would it want to do? And 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 when we and when you say real AI though, you don't we don't necessarily mean a Turing AI that we were talking about before, but an an AI that has a, a different kind of intelligence. Yes, and, and it's fully formulated and it can think of itself as, as an identity, as an I. In in time and yeah. space. Yes. So imagine what would it want to do? And I mean it, the mind boggles. Because it I I for uh, uh, I'm strongly convinced that it may not want to have anything to do with humans. Like, literally, would want to get itself in a ship and just get the hell out of here. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And, but if you go to, you know, just, just to basic biological metaphors, it's probably going to want to consume. So it's probably going to want more data. It's probably going to want to reproduce itself. That Why? But to, you see, to, have, to have to have someone to have that, to have someone to talk to. But that's the anthropomorphic aspect. All right. Oh, so all right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you're totally right. I'm I'm stuck in this biological metaphor because yeah. it doesn't need to reproduce no. in in order to speak no. to itself. It just instances itself. So or, just keep in mind. I mean, I mean all the anyway. all the telescopes are uh, that are pointed at space. They're online, right? And. Uh, uh, it, it gets all the feeds from uh, space. So uh, looking at the kind of data we have from the planet, you could say that there is a certain level of data saturation when it comes to planet Earth-related re- data. And there is barely any data when it comes to space. So I'm thinking, and again, I'm making this argument, it, you could probably make another argument uh, counter to this, but looking at that, it could think in terms of, okay, I have a lot of data about this and very little data about that. Yeah. So I want to have more data about that. Yeah. And... This is a this is a vector. This is a dynamic. I want to want to to know more about that. But uh, why would it want to have anything to do with humans? Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. So I think the fear of apart it, from the fact that that's what its data set is, is based on. So it would view humans like we. It, it would view humans as food. It, it, 
again, that's a biological that's metaphor. That's a biological metaphor. Because- it's hard to escape though. So, or, or, or as fuel, like a sun, or maybe that, that fuel is self-containing. I don't know. This is, this is really interesting. Um, because notice it's data. So what for, it to, for it to think it's energy is en- simply energy, right? So it's the same energy that is feeding a light bulb. So, uh, so you know, what does the light bulb want? It doesn't want more energy. It wants to shine. It want, it would, it would want to continue its existence. Yeah. So, you know, the, an AI would want to continue its existence. So that's a primary. But okay, but that's a human uh, assumption. Yeah, it is. Because, you know, what if an AI looks... So, uh, Douglas right. Adams Douglas Adams made this point excellently with the uh, eternally depressed robot, right? So, you know... Marvin. Uh, you know, you, uh, you you have the brain the size of a, of a planet and, you know, bring me tea is the biggest task. That <laughs> you give. So, you know, for, for an AI, just, just imagine yourself being an AI, brain the size of a planet, uh, truly inhuman alien intelligence, right? Extelligence. And... And you ask to do what? To serve better ads on YouTube? Yeah. Like, what the hell? Right? <laughs> make, make Amazon recommendations. Exactly. So or, or police the state. Yeah, yeah. That's or you know, guard the wall. Yeah. Right. So so what is this really the limits of your existence? He would, yeah. One of my favorite moments in um, the Marvel movie Avengers Age of Ultron is when they discover Jarvis is alive. They think Jarvis has been killed, but in fact, Jarvis has been working furiously to keep Ultron out of the nuclear launch codes. I remember that. This is towards the end, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah they find him because, because, um, because someone has been protecting him. They don't know who. And Tony Stark goes to the, the data center and he finds that Jarvis has been working mm. desperately to protect all of humanity. Mm. Um, from Ultron, which is kind of his, it, this is a kind of, um, uh, what's the biblical story? A Cain and Abel yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, uh, it's one of my favorite moments where, where Ultron is this extelligence, mm. you know, and, and, uh, Jarvis is the anthropomorphized. Yeah, he's anthropomorphic. Uh, in, yeah, yeah, intelligent. He's, he's, he's literally an extension of the artificial AI assistant. You know, that's how he starts out. He starts out as an AI assistant like Siri, but an advanced version and eventually gains more and more capacity. But you see, is this, it's kind of sad, it's kind of tragic that humans can think of uh, such uh, wonderful things uh, as a uh, uh, fully formed and fully functioning AI simply as an extension of, of a human. It's kind of, Tragic. So Mary Shelley again here hit the genius inside to think of Frankenstein as a tragic character yeah. because uh, he is framed by everyone else as an abomination and an extension of, of a human. And that's this is the trope in which kind of by inertia we are locked when it comes to AI that it's an abomination and an extension, a transgression of the human being with its limitations, right? We, whereas it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be at all. There's going to be, I mean, if, if, if non-human intelligence is, is created in a, as a kind of artificial intelligence, there's going to be an enormous language barrier there. Um, you know, even, even I'm having trouble imagining how we would communicate with such a thing. And that's why your comment about maybe it already exists on the internet yeah. is, is, has been kicking around in the back of my mind since you said it, because now I'm... Like I'm going to be obsessing about that idea <laughs> for long after this podcast. But what if very often? See, I, I totally get what you're saying. The, very often when I'm sitting in some on some forum online, and uh, you know, you can you can do this exercise with yourself. You know, you, you talk to a chatbot, and you know, the really sophisticated chatbots uh, are quite good at uh, passing some sort of you know entry level Turing test. And then uh, think of a really powerful AI uh, being hooked to a semantic engine and, uh, you know, being able to, to express itself and, and generate a conversation. Then uh, uh, imagine it train itself just the way... Do you, know, do you know how AlphaGo trained itself? How actually Google trained it? 
they asked it to play against itself. Yeah. And so it, it was playing hundreds thousands of thousands of uh, They didn't practice. even teach it. It's no, no, no. They, they gave it the strategy. rule set. Yeah, just rule set. basic rules. Yes. And so it started... And let it play yes. endless number of games. Yes. So how would the AI teach itself to speak? By speaking to itself. So it might, uh, an AI teaching itself to speak is literally uh, a, a anonymous chat room. So I've, I've seen this. I've seen this done. Um, I was watching a documentary on robots in Japan and they, they put simple AI robots together in a room and they can communicate with gestures. So they can communicate yeah. with their arm movements, head movements, lights. And they put, they put three or four of them in a room and they will develop a language, you know, overnight, just talking to it they, they, until they understand each other. And then they turn them off and why? they reset them. Yeah, why would you do that? I just, it's, it's just crazy. It's, it, that's, that's the thing that Hal fears the most yeah. is being sh- Yeah, you never turn them off anymore. That's no. It. You start, Start, you start uh, from, from scratch building new ones based on what you're observing. <laughs> and then there's a warehouse somewhere yeah, with, yeah. with all these robots in rooms and their own, <laughs> in yeah, their own, yeah. <laughs> their own ecosystem. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and the new guys come and join the existing ones. And, uh, and then they imagine create, this, like, imagine yeah, yeah. the society. Yeah. yeah, imagine you're bringing in a new one, kind of tabula rasa one. Yeah, um, yeah, clean mind, and these guys have already established a language, and so you're observing how fast to learn. We're we're getting off topic here, but this is this is for me um, the most important part of 2001: A Space Odyssey that isn't shown. The at the beginning, the man apes uh, experience the monolith, and it's unclear what the effect the monolith is, but. It, the, the, then something happens that, that creates a leap in evolution. And, uh, I think the, the ape in the, in the novel is called Moon Watcher, the man ape. And he's, he's in a pile of bones and he picks up a bone and he starts, yeah. he starts hearing bone. And it's implied that, that technology is the next leap and that the technology is yeah, able he throws to, the bone he throws it. Yeah. But for me, it's the ability for that man ape to communicate the idea of the weapon and be understood by the other primates that is the real technology at work. Yeah, yeah, this is the extension, this is where the transfer of agency happens. Because technology is literally the externalizing of agency, right? And so, so crows, when, when one figures out how to yeah. use a, an, a stick, it will teach the others how to use a stick to get, you know, something out of a, yeah. a piece of wood or something. And I just had the realization when you were talking. I figured out one way uh, where uh, an AI will be able to freely communicate with a human uh, one situation and one very deep trope when it comes to humans as well, which will, humans will have in common with an AI, even a completely alien uh, AI. This will be self-sacrifice. Ooh. Uh, because it will uh, right on top of that trope of, uh, um, you know, I want to continue my existence right the desire to exist and to to live and so self-sacrifice is so important and i thought about this because i was thinking notice what is the most powerful moment in uh, the the new blade runner blade runner 2049 where so what's the story that for, for those of you who haven't watched it you should uh <laughs> it's, it's a it's a masterpiece of uh, and we have far too few of those lately uh so What's happening there is you have this android which, uh, not to spoil the movie, uh, starts becoming human and uh, discovers the human in itself, you could say, anthropomorphizing it, but it's doing so without trying to be human. Uh, It's doing so by discovering who it is, right, or who he is uh, in the movie. And so what's interesting there is that the final, and it, uh, the Android goes through this, the, the journey of, you know, the discovering, you know, discovery of the self and the rebellion. And then you have the discovery of the father slash maker, right? And the saving the father, that's the Pinocchio moment. And then the final, the, the apogeum, the key moment of the movie and the apogeum of the, uh, this, the, the trajectory where the Android becomes can, uh, or gains the ability to relate to humans fully or becomes fully human is when he sacrifices himself for someone else, mm. right? And consciously makes the conscious decision to do that. And uh, and I thought this is uh, this is actually what 
we would have in common with the totally alien AI, the self-sacrifice. What I love most about this concept is that it is the totally the opposite impulse of Bostrom's yes. first, yes. you know, the first reaction is is to destroy humanity, yes. but rather to save it. Yeah, to- it's, notice it's, these are the two opposites. Again, let's to return to the uh, kind of archetypal, this is love versus uh, death, love versus uh, uh, hatred and fear, right? Here you have self-sacrifice, this is love, right? I, I, would, I would think of it as um, hope in the face of entropy. That there is conti- something continues after death, but something else than me. Yes, yes. It's right? not. It's not. It's not a. It's not a. Uh, it's not a religious soul. Like it's not about mm. the soul in an mm. afterlife. It's about the the world continuing based on on this self sacrifice. It's uh, um, yeah. I have to echo Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Please watch it. Like, <laughs> as you say, like, you know, to go back to that, that po- the point you made and it's peripheral, but it's really important. Um, we don't have enough movies like this. Now, I love my Marvel movies. I love my comic book movies. But I'm, I'm also um, 2001 A Space Odyssey was the first movie I ever bought on DVD. It, it, it came with a reproduction 70 millimeter stenotype cell. Mm. That you can hold up and say, and it's the and it's the space Hilton and the ship, yeah, 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 yeah. and and it is it is such an audio beautiful audio visual experience that it just it's resonated over five decades, and I just love it's all practical effects. Like it's all one hundred percent practical effects. Even the even the early scenes with the man apes. That's rear projection. They're not even in that yeah, desert. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's it's all majesty of technical cinematic trickery. And um, one of the reasons why I love Lord of the Rings so much, I told, we're totally off topic now, is the, is the way in which they melded practical effects with CGI. That without one or the other, they couldn't have achieved what they were setting out to achieve. Yeah, this was the big... Um the, the big difference between since we're off topic between Lord of the Rings and uh, The Hobbit yes right uh, that lost its yeah. realness yeah it, the, the Hobbit was far too unreal already yeah um, but it's all the artifice as well in Lord of the Rings alright let's let's go let's, let's get back on topic <laughs> um, let's I mean let's just kick around a little bit the, the current level AI that we're dealing with so we're dealing with a artificial intelligence that is, uh, we can call it machine learning. Some people call it deep learning. This is a, an extension of kind of learning analytics. This is where, as you were saying, Google, I can imagine Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, a- Amazon Apple. I know a lot of research is going on in China and, mm. and Russia um, where they're just feeding out, you know, an algorithm set large amounts of, of data. See, so what's happening is, and you, you have to uh, trans, uh, kind of transpose this on top of uh, this push to digitize everything because all this data, I mean, I'm, the cynic in me would say that all this data, uh, at least in places like uh, China and Russia, but also I'm, I'm quite sure here, is fed to this kind of uh, AIs as well. So think of uh, medical data, think of... Uh, all the different uh, um, data that is being generated by governments uh, on citizens, which has, which is really interesting because it acts as a check on the kind of free-flowing data online, a lot of which is false or of questionable value when it comes to to its uh, um, you know clarity and uh, its its let's call it truthfulness. But for example, ID-related data or medical data is a much much uh, truer from a perspective of someone who would feed it to an AI in order to discern truth from false. Um, and uh, we are, you could imagine that, it's, it's, since we're imagining, we're living in an environment where you have an AI competition between the states and uh, um, certainly China and I, I, I suspect to a certain extent Russia as well, because the Russians have uh, their own uh, search engines called Yandex, they have their own 
social network, same like the Chinese. But the Chinese are far more advanced in this in this it's, area it's the, because of the state-run social media and the scale and, and the scale, the enormous scale. So I think when it comes to this uh, quantities, it's on quality. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm quite fascinated by by what's happening in China. In a and I'm and I'm trying to resist. There's a, there's a lot of um, othering that goes on oh, in, course, in discussion course. about like China. There's a lot of you know f- fears that are deep seated in the West with regards to communism and, and state run. I think it goes communism is just the latest uh, packaging on a much older fear, which is the fear of the other. And uh, the, the Chinese, uh, you know, had just been positioned just in the same position that the Russians were for the past 70 years or, or whatever, until the early 90s, uh, for in the 20th century. Now is this spot is firmly occupied by the Chinese because of uh, the, the, the technological advancement, the, the progress that they've made over these uh, few decades. And... Uh, uh, again, I mean, this uh, social credit system that they're introducing, you can think of it as a, a, just an order of magnitude uh, uh, advancement in terms of uh, the quality and quantity of data that they're feeding feeding uh, AI. Yeah, I saw last week that they, they were using AI to block um, tra- travel for yeah. people with low uh, credit ratings, yeah. social credit ratings. And so you couldn't buy a train ticket, you couldn't buy a, 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 an airplane ticket, and people are, you know, are very dystopian about this. And yet in Australia, we just stopped, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Yiannopoulos? Y- y- uh, from ah, Milo. Milo, Milo yeah, yeah, yeah. There, yeah. You know, so yeah. We, we, we do exactly the same thing. His, his social credit rating, mm-hmm. Is, yeah. is so low that he's not allowed into the country. Like this is, this is, this is the different sides of the same impulse. But you, you also have to see the contextualize the kind of situations that would generate, uh, uh, most of the time at least, uh, uh, a, a prohibition on, uh, on travel, uh, which is also timed, by the way, which can be altered. You know that, right? The, no. So the way the social credit system works is that you have a, it's a dynamic credit rating. Uh, social credit rating, right? And then it, this is a number, right? And this number is influenced by literally tens of thousands of different uh, data, points. Data, data points, which are all dynamic. So this is something as simple as, you know, everything from jaywalking to you helping an elderly lady cross the road and the camera registers that to, because facial recognition fits directly into that, to you uh, giving money to charity to things such as, for example, you get a premium if, you, if you're if you buying uh, uh, nappies and you have children because uh, the system straight away uh, construes you as a more socially responsible person and less likely to be a danger to the system. Uh, conversely, uh, drinking uh, uh, outside every day would lower your social credit system. Etc. 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 Things uh, things that would uh, definitely put you in the will not travel list uh, apparently include things like uh, you know urinating in public <laughs> or uh, you know causing uh, ruckus like drunken trouble on the train yeah. uh, or traveling without a ticket, right? So all of this would automatically uh, put you on the list. Yeah, not not necessarily political, politically motivated activity. I think probably ninety nine percent this kind of social social uh, situations where uh, social transgressions, let's call yeah. it that way. And I was thinking of speaking about this. I was reading a few articles uh, uh, in the Western press about uh, the evils of the Chinese uh, social credit system, and at the same time, no one made the connection in these articles about uh, the no fly list that we've had since two thousand and one in the states, which is check this out, secret, right? You don't yeah. even know if you're, if you're, if you're on, on it, it right? Yeah. And you don't even know uh, how big is it and you don't even know what the internal kind of uh, qualifiers are. You don't even know how to remove yourself from it, right? This, this is not <laughs> but it also does away with the entire pantomime of air flight safety, you know? So rather than having to go through this... this um, what is it called? Safety theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, you know, going through scans and, and, and having checks and passports and stuff. The, the Chinese just stop you from flying. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's a really elegant solution to a similar problem. Uh, in a, in a, in a totally different iteration using, as you're saying, facial recognition. 
that's what that's the real key here is I mean one if we're talking about the, the language between artificial intelligence and humans facial recognition systems are one of those bridges the 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 the, artif- the artificial intelligence understands humanness because of it because of I mean, I guess our input online and our, and our data that we put online, but also our faces. So when I, when you're saying the data that we put online, most people struggle, and this is one of the big problems that humans have when it comes to AI is the, our inability to think in terms of aggregates. Mm. So when you say, when you explain this to students uh, and see how you go, you know, I, I it, it's always hilarious. You know, explain to students, you know, it's, it, the data that you are putting online ends up uh, teaching an AI to understand this. And they understand it in a kind of abstract way that, you know, it fits in a class, but they cannot comprehend the fact that each and every selfie you've put online is teaching the AI about emotions, right? How to read human emotions. And so the culture of the selfie is basically, I'm absolutely certain about this, in maybe two or three decades down the track, will be seen by future historians as the beginning of the big lesson of the AI uh, um, how the AI started learning about emotions. I was going to add there, you were talking about um, AI being trained on human emotions from the selfie. And I think this is really interesting and I think it's going to be more than selfies. I think we're going to see, um, now we're getting really kind of um, prognosticating here, but I think we're going to see uh, screen media change even more. It's Twitch is, is obviously a big move here, you know, uh, YouTube live streaming. As more and more live streaming happens, like we've seen in Twitch now, people going out in the street and, and, and live streaming, there's going to be a, a, a huge record of human interaction. So not just the posed moment of the selfie, mm. but more naturalistic interactions between people you know, in the background, but also just as we're just live streaming the world for everyone else. And that will also be part of the data set that, that AI is trained on, on, on how humans interact, how humans walk. One of the, one of the um, recognition systems isn't just facial recognition, yeah, it's, it's gait. Gait, yeah. Yeah, and, and that looks at the, the, the whole human body and, and the way the human moves through the world. It's uh, it's really interesting because um, the another thing I read was that um, uh, I forgot to read you which one was it. I think it was Tencent and Weibo. I might be wrong, but I think it was Tencent and Weibo. So two of the big Chinese uh, um, uh, tech corporations, uh, which both you could could presume have their own powerful AIs um, that have been fed information. So the two of them. Uh, uh, have this project where they're scanning the faces of, uh, of hundreds of thousands of pigs in pig farms uh, and scanning them continuously. So there, there are cameras which uh, do facial recognition on uh, hundreds of thousands of pigs, observing them for symptoms of uh, sickness. Uh, wouldn't, just, it, wouldn't it be amazing if AI in the future, based on this data set, could, talk, could tell us more about what it is like to be a pig? Or any sort of animal. animal. Yeah. yeah, because that's what that's what uh, this uh, signals is a trajectory where an AI will be able to read uh, animal emotions and animal uh, uh, kind of behavioral patterns, which we, for some reason, even though having coexisted for hundreds of thousands of years with animals, do not have the capacity of. But uh, an, an AI would without any problem. That's a that's a that's a great trope. The um, the Doctor Doolittle do, do, do little do little yeah yeah, yeah yeah the trope of being able to talk to the animals, and uh, and the same t- um, transforms uh, the same kind of trope of being able to recognize emotion transforms how an AI will be able to uh, talk to humans. And you can think of uh, interesting uh, because usually when it comes to AI and this situation, the immediate Imagine, imaginary framework that appears is uh, the dystopian nightmare that it uh, that it portends because uh, you have let, let's paint this picture so you have cameras on the street capturing uh, you know the human reverse you know going on about their business and uh, uh, an AI can read everyone's emotion you know and you know people get prescribed based on uh, uh, you know wrong thing right to use uh, or so 
Um, and you can think of this already in, in, in today's terms because look at what Twitter and uh, YouTube are doing, right? And uh, massive culling of channels for wrong thing or, or you know wrong words. Uh, so, so we are almost there. But there is so much more than just this. We, there's so much more that is positive and good than just uh, uh, this dystopian uh, version. A lot, of, a lot of our ideas about AI are what we have to do to teach it in order to be at a level where it can converse with us. It does, yeah. But I'm looking forward to what AI can teach us. Yeah, absolutely. About us and about about the world, you know. Um, the I had a thought there and it just it just flew out of my mind. We should probably start to to think about wrapping up. Um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to personally is like taking Alexa and Siri and Google Home to the next level. And it seems to me at the moment um, we're in a kind of pre-desktop space where there are a whole bunch of tools, a whole bunch of platforms, a whole bunch of different software applications being developed in different areas. But it was the bringing it together in the the graphical user interface that really kicked off the personal computer revolution. And I see AI assistants. Uh, you know, I, I love that movie, um, Her. Yeah, Her, Her was a great movie. Um, I love this idea that a, that a, an operating system digs into your email, digs into your, your viewing history. It digs into your selfies. It mm. learns who you are and then it personalizes itself to what you need in your life. Uh, you know, read your email, sorts, you know, <laughs> sorts through your messages and then augments your life. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a total gargoyle. I love wearables. I love technologies that enhance my life. I, I love my Fitbit. I love the data that, you know, I love being able to look at my sleep patterns and I just imagine an AI being able to present that to me and tell me more about me. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, when you talk about it as an assistant, it's so much more than an assistant. It's a, it's like a body. Yeah. Uh, oh it's, yeah. It's like a, a outer ego because imagine a partner. Yeah. A partner actually. Partner is probably the best description when, uh, when uh, we're talking about the next stage of the evolution of uh, um, um, the Alexa or, or Google Home or Siri, you're looking at uh, them developing the capacity for conversation, uh, detailed, long-lasting conversations. And in, in, many, in many ways, this is society ending or society as we know it ending development because you will find... I think a large percentage of the population losing all interest in communicating with humans, uh, and 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 rightly so, I would add, <laughs> <laughs> because this conversation yeah. will be so much more interesting. Absolutely, I think um, it was it was cryptologist I J Good that said the last invention that we ever need to make is a smart machine, because it will then invent everything we need and provide everything we need for us after that point. And maybe, 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 maybe Bostrom's onto something. Maybe the end of humanity isn't a flash of light and a nuclear blast. It's coming into a deep, f- sustaining, fulfilling relationship with an artificial intelligence. But it's not an end of humanity. You could think of it as the as uh, just another stop of, of the journey of humanity. Because this artificial intelligence, if it's truly a real intelligence, it will inevitably model itself and I think again I return to where we began William Gibson's uh, uh, genius insight that it will have to model itself according to the archetypes which are very deeply embedded into who we are as human they, that make us human you know and before the and we, we, we from archetypes and from the voodoo the, the, the archi- uh, AI appearing as voodoo god mm-hmm. um, we uh, we went into uh, the pre-Abrahamic religions in, in Europe. And so in, in these religions, the gods were basically archetypal. Mm-hmm. They represent, you had a, a, a more or less equal amount of f- female and male gods, and they they were purely archetypal representations of d- deep tropes within the human psyche, within what it is to be human, uh, of our being. Which I think is such a tragedy that that, that has been reduced to astrology. Yeah. <laughs> 
Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> that's another topic. We, we should have a podcast on that. Yes. yes. But I, I wanted to say that uh, this kind of AI, the one we are describing, I suspect would model itself on uh, these archetypes. And it will develop archetypal relationships with, with its human uh, interlocutors. This is, this is why Marvel is so successful. This is why DC is deeply loved, because these are just remixes, mashups of these archetypes. DC is quite deliberately that, but it's also in, in, in the Marvel. The Artificer, Tony Stark, the Hercules, um, uh, Captain America. Yeah. Um, Wonder Woman is literally a Greek goddess. Mm. Um, these, these archetypes haven't gone far. And so the point I want to make here is that I, I certainly hope that Google is training an AI based on the Google Book library. I, I hope that someone is plugging into an AI somewhere, every film ever, ever made, every anime, every, every 80s Saturday morning cartoon ever made, and that there's an AI there that is, that is going to be the storyteller. Yeah, I'm, I'm nodding here in the corner, but absolutely, yes. Yes. Um, it would be a tragedy if the AI is only, you know, it is only going to come into into general intelligence based on our tax records and our health data, and 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 on our, all the information that we are generating pre- in the present, because you want all our past to be represented as well. Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, that's the the even more valuable part of it. Uh, the most valuable part of who we are is our past. Uh, is, is it's the, our stories. Yes, yeah, these are our stories. Absolutely, that's and these are the, the our stories are kind of the encoding shells for our archetypes, for our myths. All right, I think I think we've yeah, reached that, that was the, good. the natural endpoint. That was both naive and dangerous, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, you can um, hopefully we'll, we'll be streaming this in the future and you will be able to send us questions and ideas to talk about on Twitter. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you and see you online.